You're listening to the Lessons in Real Estate Show, sponsored by Mission First Capital, bringing real estate investment deals for active duty and veteran investors. Your host, Anthony Pinto, searched land, air, and sea to find military investors just like you investing in multifamily and commercial real estate, both active duty and veterans. Hear their stories, learn their lessons, and be inspired by the obstacles they have overcome on their path to financial freedom. Whether you are overseas or stationed at home, if you want to get started as a military real estate investor, this is the show for you. And now your host, Anthony Pinto. Hey learners and welcome back to a, another episode of the Lessons in Real Estate show. I'm your host, Anthony Pinto, and super excited to have a real estate rock star here today. And, um, you know, listening to her story and talking with her over the past few months, I think that she's going to definitely have a lot to offer here over, you know, the next 30 minutes or so um, in terms of, you know, her unique journey coming to America, her real estate background, I mean, her her awesome educational background. So uh, Julia is a first generation Chinese American immigrant, and she came to America at age 14 in 2012 and didn't speak English. Uh, and then she went on to get a appointment to the Naval Academy and received a, a bachelor's degree in quantitative economics, as well as a follow on master's degree in finance from John Hopkins University at, or uh, yep, Cary Business School. She is now a nuclear trained SWO in the Navy and is also the co-founder of Middle Bridge Holdings, which has managed to acquire one apartment in Japan, one piece of land in Anchorage, and is about to close an apartment in Guam. Julia, I'm really excited to have you here. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Anthony. You make me sound so good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, I've had a, a lot of, of uh, you know, class of 2018 or sorry, 2019, 2020 mm -hmm. guys come on the show and talk about, you know, their experiences with doing real estate as an ensign. And, you know, when I'm thinking back to what I was like as an ensign, I was I was not thinking at all about, you know, real estate or, you know, what it could do to build my future or really even financial freedom in general. So mm -hmm. hearing from you, you guys like uh, you and Hirsch Ray and Nick Vu and, you know, Philip, it's just, it's amazing to me to see the mindset you guys have at such a young age and such as a starting point in your career. I mean, you know, you're, you're going to have to have a four or five year more commitment. Sure. Um, but the time that, you can spend working on real estate during that time. I mean, I, I mean, it, it is truly awe inspiring the way you guys have gotten started so early. So I think you definitely have a lot to, to be, um, to, to talk about and be a rock star about. So, uh, really appreciate coming on here today. Thank you very much. I'm excited to talk to you as well. Exactly. Absolutely. All right. So let's just start from the beginning. I mean, it's, it's not very common that, um, you know, you have a an immigrant come over here and then within a matter of what, four or five years, learn a new language and get into one of the premier universities in the in the country. So let's let's kind of talk through your your background, starting from coming to America. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, basically, my parents divorced when I was very young and my mom remarried. So that's how I ended up in a very small town in the middle of Nowhere, Pennsylvania. I went to a public high school in Pennsylvania. My graduating class was 96 people. I was the only non-Caucasian student in my entire high school. So let alone in, like ESL students, I was like the only non-Caucasian student. Mm -hmm. um, so like I got there, I didn't speak English. Definitely heard a lot of Asian jokes, <laughs> racist jokes. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, like, I think just don't say no to anything. You know, you got to try everything and don't let anyone else tell you no either. You got to believe in yourself. So you, ha you should have an open mind. So while I was in high school, I tried everything, right? Like basically all the sports team, all the clubs. So by the time I graduated from my high school, literally from not speaking English, I was a cross country team captain. I was a cheerleader. I was in the homecoming court. I was in the National Honor Society as vice president. And I graduated top five of my graduating class. And I had a lot of fun along the way. Like I went to parties, you know, like all the dances. I had so much fun along the way too. Now, um, I mean, the, mm -hmm. let's, so let's, let's kind of tap there because I think that's um, extremely impressive what you've been able to you to manage. I mean, a lot of people who, who you're born in this country and 
you know, uh, let's say take kind of take for granted the opportunities that we have available mm -hmm. to us. And, you know, being in, in a first generation um, immigrant as well, I totally understand. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, what are some of the challenges that you kind of you kind of touched on a little bit? What, what additional challenges did you have coming to a brand new country and trying to learn one of arguably one of the most difficult languages to learn? Um, I think one of the most important thing is obviously is the language barrier. And the key to that, you got to be able to speak, you got to be able to open your mouth, right? So I think so many new immigrants to another country, they're afraid of speak a new language. They're like, oh my God, I have an accent. Other people are going to make fun of me. But you know, like English is, is it's just a language. It's to communicate. Yes, I have an accent. But, you know, I mean, Anthony, you also have an accent. You have an American accent. Mm -hmm. When you go to Great Britain or when you go to Australia, they're going to be like, ah, that guy has an accent, right? So you got to, like, get over that barrier. And then it's very mental. It's all mental, right? You cannot be shy. Just put yourself out there. I would rather, like, say too much and, like, speak too quickly than not speak and regret not saying anything later on. I love that. Um, Thank you. And another thing, um, when I was applying for the naval, uh, at the Naval Academy, I was actually a Chinese citizen. I was still a Chinese citizen. I didn't get my citizenship until a few months after I got my appointment to the academy. So when I was applying, everyone told me it's impossible. Like everyone told me like, you never get a nomination. Like they'll never accept you. And in my high school, I'm actually the first person in the high school's history to get into the Naval Academy. So, you know, there's like no one in my high school ever applied to the Naval Academy. And they're like, why would they take you? Blah, 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 blah. Um, but again, just don't let other people tell you no. You got to try your best. And if, you know, by I day, I still didn't get an appointment to the Academy, then I'll finally tell myself no. But before that, you know, fear again. America's land of opportunity, right? <laughs> Yeah. I mm -hmm. think that it's amazing that you, you've been able to handle a lot of these hardships, um, you know, throughout your life. I mean, probably from day one showing up in America, obviously having the, the large language barrier, obviously, you know, not having the, um, a lot of the cultural norms figured out that a lot of, you know, guy or, you know, teenagers at your age, I mean, you're coming here, what, 14, 15, that's a very, um, total time in, in American teenagers kind of lives and to pretty much, you know, uproot yourself from your life in China to come to America to, you know, learn a new language and learn the cultural you know, behaviors and excel at doing that, I think is amazing that you've been able to, um, to overcome a lot of those barriers and just push through regardless. And it sounds like you have, you know, consistently done that over and over and over again, you know, uh, graduating at the top of your class in high school and you know, graduating at the top of your class in the Naval Academy, getting into the Naval Academy in the first place, you know, going to, you know, get your master's right after you graduated, uh, you know, being a nuke swell option. I mean, there's just a lot of these steps that you've, uh, you've accomplished. And, and where do you think a lot of that motivation and that drive comes from? Um, so first, I am extremely lucky to be where I am today, right? So as a first generation immigrant coming from nothing, I just have the opportunity, like the same opportunity, education and trainings to compete against, you know, sons and daughters of admirals, congressmen, businessmen at the Naval Academy and actually, you know, winning at times. Like this is just still give me chills at night, right? I don't think this would happen anywhere else, but here in America. So I just, I just feel like I'm such a lucky person and I feel like definitely a lot of times people complain a lot. I complain a lot to you. Maybe not, maybe not right now, maybe not on a podcast, but I definitely complain a lot to my friends. Um, too often we say like, why me, why me, why me? But you know, why not me? I felt like instead of saying, why me? We should start saying, why not me? Um, and I think a huge reason that keep me going forward is that I have so much to prove. I've been so lucky. I, I do want to make the world a better place. And I felt like I am in a position where I have the potential to do so. And I really want to test the limit to see how far I can go, how much influence I can have in the future as a minority, as a female, as an immigrant, as a naval officer, as a Chinese American, like all these ships or, you know, like all these things on me, I really want to see how many glass ceilings I can break, how far I can care, like, you know, how far I can go in life, basically. You know, I, hearing you talk, um, it's, 
I would not be surprised in 20 years from now when we hear from Admiral Zhu and you know, oh my you're, you're the CNO. And I mean, it, but it starts, it starts with the mindset that you're talking about here, whether it's in, you know, in the Navy, staying in the Navy for 20 years or whether it's getting into real estate or business um, that kind of uh, win at any cost kind of attitude that, that attitude where you're focusing on the positives rather than the negatives. Right. Um, you know, the old adage where focus goes, energy flows, I think is, is absolutely true. And, you know, a lot of people get held up in the, um, in, particularly when they're getting started in a lot of the negatives that are associated with real estate, like mm-hmm. having to, you know, deal with toilets and tenants and having to, you know, uh, deal with, you know, units being torn up and all these things instead of, you know, the financial opportunity and what it could mean for you and your family and all these. And so I think it's very, um, it's very mature mindset to have. Uh, you know, as a, you know, 20, early 20 year old, to be able to build out, you know, know, know the path for your financial future, um, and financial freedom in the future. And so let's kind of dig into that, because what you've managed to accomplish over the past, you know, two years since you, you've graduated, um, is truly, is truly tremendous. And I feel like every time I talk with you, it's just, you're, you're, working on some larger project that I'm like, whoa, like how, like, like I, you know, even with the experience I have is like, oh my gosh, I don't know how I would even go about accomplishing this. So let's start with that first apartment building in Japan. Cause I didn't even know about this until last week when we talked. So how did you, how did you just tell us the story behind this? Okay. Um, so first I cannot take all the credit. Um, uh, my mentor or the, the guy who introduced me to real estate is actually a USNA 2019 grad, Jun Shen. A lot of people know him as a cancer survivor. I think he was on your podcast not that long ago. So um, <clears throat> right after graduation, I actually found him on LinkedIn and I just reached out to him. I was like, hey, I see that you're in real estate. Can we talk? And he was like, well, yeah, like I'm actually starting uh, an internship program where we do meetups every two weeks. Are you interested in coming with me? I'm like, yeah, absolutely. So he's a guy who definitely, you know, like kind of like opened the door for me. And my partner, also my boyfriend, Philip Nettleton, like I definitely will not be where I am today without him. He just one of the smartest guy I know and our skills are so compatible with each other. I'm the talker. I can talk and talk and talk, but he's a doer. He's actually the one who's like doing all the things behind the scene. Like you might not see him everywhere. You might not see him at all the meetups and LinkedIn, um, but he's definitely the one who's like doing a lot of the stuff behind the scene. So we work so well together and he's also very, very ambitious. I might have a mindset, but sometimes I don't see things outside of my education. They're like both of my parents are working class. Um, so I don't even know the concept of financial freedom. I thought we should be in a W-2 job. Like, j- like all we can do is a bad, higher salary. That's like the best I can do. You know, my parents always tell me like, oh, you're, you're like, you're like, like, don't try, like, don't go into, don't go into entrepreneurship. Like those are too risky. So I kind of grew up with that education. And Philip is really the one who, you know, he bought me the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. He bought me the book, uh, Apartment Syndication. And he was the one who was like, like, you know, we would be millionaires in a few years. We would be billion years in the future. So, you know, he is really like the visionary here. No, mm-hmm. I, you know, I, I think it's, um, there's a lot of different books that talk about this uh, in terms of partnerships that we make in life and in business in particular. And it's often um, two, two subsets of individuals when it comes to building a successful business. Mm-hmm. Normally one, the visionary and the, and the person who's more of a people person. And then you got the, the implementer or the operational side of things. And, you know, I've, I've found that to be true in, in my own business. And I, and it sounds like that is, you know, true for you guys as well, that mm-hmm. you'd be able to um, um, complement each other and find the right set of skills to each kind of work in your own lane and help each other succeed and grow uh, in your mm-hmm. business. So kudos there. Yeah, definitely. All right. So go back to the first apartment we mm-hmm. bought, which is actually in Japan. Um, so after graduation, after we were introduced to the real estate market, we just really wanted to explore and see how, what we can do. However, all the podcasts we listen to, all the, everyone we talk to you, tell us like, oh, she used her VA loan, she used her VA loan. Um, so because I went to grad school in the DC Baltimore area, like Johns Hopkins, 
we actually look a lot into using the VA law in that area. However, because my grad school only went till December, which was six months after graduation, we weren't able to use the VA law. Um, but like, mm -hmm. I thought like that's a lot of our experience, like first hand experience, touring apartment, talking to you to real estate brokers came from. And after that, a lot of people told us, you know, like, just give up, you're going to Japan, like go to Japan, go enjoy life. You, got, you guys are going to be so busy. Just come back in two years, two, two three years um, while you're in new power school or, you know, like during your second tour, you can use a VA loan and then buy your own home, blah, blah, blah. Um, but the two of us being very, very stubborn and very, very, like, uh, I guess, driven, we decided that we're going to look into the Japan market. We found that it is a very interesting market. So the Yoko base, Yokosuka, which Anthony is where you are at, I'm sure you can speak on this as well, is a suburb of Tokyo and Yokohama. The price of real estate there is actually very cheap. However, the rent is very high because military people overseas, the government pay you a fixed amount of rent. So $2,000 every month for me and definitely higher for Anthony, you know, because he, sir, because <laughs> he's higher rank than me. Um, so like you can buy a cheap property and rent it out to US military at an artificially high price. And this is such a unique niche market that we don't think you can find anywhere else. Um, so we found an apartment that's for sale for $70,000. We bought it. Um, after the closing costs, realtor fee, and we furnish the apartment a little bit, it comes out about $80,000. And we're able to rent it out to other military officers for $2,000 every month. So that's a huge cash on cash return. Um, so like it sounds really cool and really glamorous, but the process of getting there was extremely hard. Um, so we talked to every single person on LinkedIn, like just typing the keyword, uh, Japan real estate. Like we personally talked to almost everyone. We talked to a hundred plus people. And I can tell you that probably 95% told us it's impossible. Like some of them said, you're too young, you just enjoy life. Some of them said, oh, Japan, Japan like the Japan, just Japan market is going to crash. Everything depreciate. Some people tell us, oh, you're investing outside your neighborhood. If you cannot touch, if you cannot feel your property every day, you should not buy it. Some people tell us, like, it's such a risky market. You're going to lose all your money in a few years. So, like, everyone told us no. Um, however, Philip and I, we just didn't give up on each other. So, when I feel really, really down, down he's here to help me. And when he's feeling down, I'm here to cheer him up. And in the end, we bought the property hard cash because in Japan, there's no lenders unless you are a Japanese citizen. So as an American citizen, you might be able to get a loan from Hong Kong or Singapore, but it's going to be extremely difficult. And the interest rate will be a lot higher with a lot more terms. Um, so that's the, one of the biggest problems, stopping people from buying properties in overseas. They cannot get a loan. Second, uh, funding the property. So there's no Zillow. There's no Redfin for Japan. Um, so we actually went on some like pretty, pretty sketchy Japanese websites. And um, so that's the second problem. The third problem is that there are very minimal English speaking realtors in Japan, especially that market. I'm sure you can find more in Tokyo, but in the Yo Yokosuka market, you basically cannot find anyone. So I had to use my, my connection, actually my mom's connection. And I found a Japanese Chinese realtor who speaks Japanese and Chinese. And every communication we had, like every documents we, we signed were translated into three different languages, like Japanese into Chinese and English and English into Chinese back into Japanese. Um, and we did a lot of like Zoom, like two o'clock, like two o'clock in the morning. So in the AM, waking up, touring apartments, uh, just virtually and stuff like that. Yeah, so it definitely was very challenging, but we're able to pull it off. You know, often the uh, the most lucrative deals are the ones that have the most barriers to it because there's not as much competition. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. what you're what you're talking about is something that I have we yeah, I have toyed around, toyed around in my head as well. What trying to do here because yeah, you know, I'm looking at the place I'm living here now, and mm -hmm. I'm paying you know probably about twice as much as a normal Japanese citizen mm -hmm. would pay for this place just because because the landlord can. Right. And it's, you know, yeah. it's, a, it's a house out in town and 
Um, yeah, I mean, what you're what you're talking about there, I think, is a tremendous opportunity, and it's amazing that you um, realize that not being here. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. I didn't I didn't realize a lot of the benefits of investing here in Japan, and obviously a lot of the barriers um, and, you know, and problems associated with it until I actually got here. And I, and I firsthand, you know, uh, experienced what it was like to go through the rental process here and how much it was actually going to cost. And, um, you know, all the inspections that go into it and how much real estate is actually worth here and all that. And so I think that's amazing and, and tremendous that you were able to kind of, um, capitalize on that opportunity to invest here without actually physically being here. And then only, not only that, obviously get over a lot of the barriers um, that it takes to get here. I mean, lending alone is huge within this area, right? Um, Not to mention the language barrier, not to mention that it's halfway around the world, um, you know, and, you know, one other thing that, you know, Julie didn't mention is that real estate here is is valued much differently than it is back in the States. So, um, you know, a hundred thousand dollar house, you know, that you buy in, you know, 2000, you would reasonably expect that it's going to appreciate in value, you know, over 10, 20 years or so, um, which you is probably true where, what, whatever market you're investing in back in the States. Well, but in, in Japan, a property um, that depreciates in value, which when we think of depreciation back in the States, that's from a tax basis. And, you know, over a certain amount of time, it's going to give you, you know, it's going to depreciate in value on a tax kind of, and purely in taxes alone, um, even though the value has, is actually appreciating. But in Japan, it is physically depreciating in value from the time that you buy it until the time that you sell it. So, you know, normally a 20 to 30 year depreciation will get you, you know, um, pretty much depreciate the whole value of the property in terms of taxes back in the States. Well, the physical value of the property in Japan has completely depreciated. So, you know, a property that's worth or that's, you know, 20, 30 years old is practically worth nothing. And, you know, it's still, it's still a standing structure. It's still a good structure. You know, it's still functional as a rental, um, Mm -hmm. but it's, it's extremely inexpensive, like you mentioned. And I think uh, realizing and capitalizing on that, I think is, is huge that you're able to do that. So, um, so how did you kind of come up with this, this thought process in the, in the first place? How did you even know to, to think about this, to think about, you know, buying and renting out to uh, military guys? Um, again, that's where the part of having a really good partner comes in. So Philip and I, uh, we talk 24-7, right? And now even where, where, you know, he's in Japan, I'm here in San Diego. We still talk like two, three hours every day. And like our friends ask us, they're like, what do you guys talk about? And we're like, well, we talk about one hour stock market, one hour real estate, half an hour about our company, and half, half an hour about our day. Here you go, that's three hours. Um, so the whole thought process is just us talking to each other back and forth, back and forth. And like him questioning, like, like asking us why we can't do it. And like maybe me listening to him all the reasons why we cannot. And he come up with a counter argument and like vice versa. That's like actually just how we like did everything so far. That's crazy. I mean, it's, mm-hmm. it's amazing that you guys have built this, this partnership again, um, to, to something that's, you know, and, and buying, buying your first property internationally. I mean, it's hard enough to buy your first property in the United States, but doing it with hard cash, without lending, doing it in a foreign country and all the language barriers. I mean, I think it's amazing. And I'm really excited to see, you know, what you kind of build out in the future here in Japan. Mm-hmm. But what I really want to get into is, you know, you, you dealt with single family homes here in Japan, and now you're getting into the larger multifamily side of things. So let's talk about this apartment in, in Guam. Mm-hmm. Okay. So after the, J- the J- Japan market, we're like, wow, this is actually such a great like niche market to focus on. I, I remember this conversation distinctly with Philip. So I basically asked him like, hey, like, should we do buy more properties overseas so we can like capitalize on the fact that military overseas get OHA, overseas housing allowance, which you know is a set amount paid by the government. It's like a high-end section eight. Um, right, like where else can we find the market? And he was like, let me do some research. And then like that night he came back with a huge list. He was like, oh, we can invest in Europe. There are some properties in Australia and there's Guam. And I was like, wait, I think Guam is US territory. And he was like, let's look into, into Guam. And that's how we found Guam as one of our interest points. 
So Guam is actually the only place in the whole world where it's U.S. territory. So you can get a U.S. loan from a U.S. bank and it's governed by U.S. law. But military, traveling nurse contractors and government workers get uh, uh, like an overseas housing allowance, which is set fixed amount paid by the U.S. government. So you get all the same benefit as the benefits you get in Japan. Um, however, like it's a lot cheaper. That's mm-hmm. really, I mean, I, th- I think that's kind of the best of all the worlds that you talked about there, you know, and, and for those, uh, those guys who may not be military and kind of understand the BAH and the housing allowances that we get um, back in the States, we get a fixed amount of money depending on where you live. So, you know, uh, and depending on your rank, so you may get $1,500 for living in Norfolk for your housing, mm-hmm. right. Or you may get $3,000 for living in San Diego, right. It's based off of the price in the area. And so if you decide to, rent out a house for, um, you know, a thousand dollars, you essentially get to keep the difference between that. But with OHA overseas housing allowance, you, you know, you find a house that you want to rent for $2,000. That's exactly what you're getting in housing and, you know, additional for utilities as well. You find a house you rent for a thousand dollars. That's exactly what you're getting. You know, and, and so I think that's a, I think it's a really great advantage to have OHA as an option because most military guys who get OHA are not trying to get a lot of money back because obviously they're, they're not getting any of that capital back. So they're just mm-hmm. going for the most expensive place they can get. So they don't care if they're spending, you know, two, if they're spending all of their OHA on that, right? Like we spend $2,000 on this place here, but we could have easily afforded, you know, a 25, 3000 or, a, you know, 2,500 or $3,000 place if we wanted to, to max out, you know, our OHA here. Um, so I think that's really smart that you, you saw an opportunity to take advantage of, you know, getting U.S. loans, which obviously is very advantageous given the interest rates we're seeing mm-hmm. and just given the housing market as a whole, but also mm-hmm. getting to benefit from the, you know, the OHA that the military guys are going to be making. So, all right. So you kind of saw this opportunity to, you know, tap into a market that was, uh, um, had a lot of potential to it. So it's one thing to kind of see the opportunity. It's another thing to start taking advantage of it. So how did you guys actually start um, getting into looking at the real estate there? Um, so Philip and I, we started looking for houses in Guam and we got in touch with the realtors in Guam. Uh, very soon, there's a, there's, a, there's a condo that meet every single one of our credential came on the market for $190,000. So basically this apartment is a turnkey property um, is in a great location, very close to the naval base and very close to the Air Force, Air Force base as well. Um, very close to a supermarket. There's a gas station nearby, it's a gated community, it's fully renovated and it's fee simple. So we just decided that we're gonna go purchase it. Um, and after, so like it's a 190,000 property, we, we were able to take out a loan in Guam with the US bank. So it's 20% down payment. So we put down about $40,000 with all the other costs, probably about $45,000. And we're planning on renting it out to military for 22, like 2205 to be exact every month. Don't include utility. Um, And there are only like five banks on Guam because you know, there's no large commercial banks in Guam. There's all like private lenders and smaller local banks. We talked to all of them actually. So yeah, so we basically know like all the banks in Guam too now. So yeah, we believe in the market so much that we're willing to put our own capital into buying the like buying a condo there. I know we already brought a full circle. So we did not think that we're gonna get into syndication and commercial multifamily homes, but we saw the market, like we see the market first. We found out about, about the opportunity and we personally invested in the market and we like the market so much that we want to start doing syndication in that market. So like versus a lot of people who decided that they don't do syndication and multifamily, and then they start looking for market. We found the market first. And then because of the market, we want to do like bigger project basically. Yeah, no, I think that's, I think that's really cool what you guys have, have uh, managed to do there. And you know, almost proof of concept, you know, figured out that, uh, you know, this is a market you want to invest in. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, for a lot of investors, that's almost more important than who the operators are is like, hey, especially in a market like that, where it might as well be a foreign country to a lot of people like Mm -hmm. I doubt, you know, most Americans who 
who are wanting to invest even know where Guam is or know that it's, you know, literally in the middle of, of nowhere, right? Uh, out, in the, in the, out in the Pacific. Um, so I think that that's really cool that you guys have a proof of concept that you can show, hey, yes, we bought this property here. We were able to get this lending for it. You know, we're making this amount of money off of it. This is a property mm -hmm. management company we're using. You know, these are the renovations, right? Um, and have a proof of concept there and a track record within that market when you start, you know, raising money and doing syndications for it. You know, I yes, think absolutely. Cool. Yeah, absolutely. And like, actually, after we bought the our condo, we we learned so much more about the market. Like, we just bought a condo targeting military. However, after talking to other realtors and bankers in Guam, we we realized Guam is actually a very diversified place. We are like, it's not just military, but they're also traveling nurses, contractors, government employees who again get a fixed government rate, which is artificially high. Not only that, Guam is a huge tourist destination. They, they receive a lot of tourists. Like I think it's like 1.5 million tourists uh, before COVID um, from Asia because you know it's US territory. So passport, you get a US passport like stamp and there's no sales tax. So a lot of the Chinese tourists, Japanese tourists go there to buy like their luxury brand, like LV and you know, like, um, coach, Rolex, because there's no sales tax and it's much, much closer to Asia than, Hawa than Hawaii and, you know, like mainland US. So it's only two hours away from the Philippines and like three hours or even like shorter from all the other Asian countries. So it has, it's just a huge tourist destination. They also have all the beaches you know, surfing, hiking, like Hawaii, but it's a lot closer and cheaper to Asia. And Guam is just very underdeveloped right now for being a U.S. territory. You know, like just again, like what you said, people don't know about like this market. People have never heard of Guam. People don't even know that's U.S. territory. And they're just like no money, like no money from the state going to Guam. But however, just it's such a niche market and we see so much growth gonna like ha be happening in Guam in the next few years. And I'm sure Anthony being the military terror, you know that the, uh, the Marine Corps base in Okinawa is actually all gonna be moving to Guam in the next few years. So on October 1st, 2000, 2020, so about four months ago, the Marine Corps has officially established um, a Marine Corps base on Guam as well. So they're about to move 5,000 Marines from Japan to Guam in the next like three or four years. And going with the 5,000 Marines are their family supporting personnel that can easily increase the Guam's population by like 5%, like if not more. And all those people, they need a place to live. Like, yes, I guess like military can provide some on base housing, but a lot of these people, they are gonna be seeking housings off base. So like we're gonna see a huge population growth and once COVID is over, you know, like all the people, like all the people in Asia, they want to go out. They want to go travel again, you know, for, by them going to Guam, they can tell like all their friends and relatives, they went to America while the flights are only like a few hundred dollars and like two hours away. Mm -hmm. So we just see so much opportunities there right now. Yeah. You know, I, I think it's uh, it's really interesting, and and you know, I was in Guam for a few months or so. It's mm -hmm. a gorgeous area. I mean, so so yeah. much to do there. The dive, the scuba diving is world renowned. But you know, I think um, what you're talking about there in terms of population growth and 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 just you know, uh, growth and job diversity and and growth of there's a lot of different opportunities there is absolutely true. You know, and as as one of the um, the closest base American bases, like actual main or like actual American owned base mm -hmm. or i guess territory um to asia and as we you know we're pivoting more towards that area i just think it's gonna you know blow up even more i mean you know mm -hmm. it's great to have a basis you know like we have in japan and in south korea and, and so on and so forth you know in singapore but having a a solid american owned you know piece of land so close to you know the, those areas is huge i mean you know, and they have everything there. I mean, like they have a huge Air Force base. There's, uh, you know, a large Army contingency. There's obviously a large naval presence there. I mean, submarines. I mean, I, I, the whole gambit in terms of Navy and now Marine Corps there. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just, it's amazing. I think it's amazing the, the growth that is going to come to to Guam. It kind of, and I've personally seen it firsthand, um, you know, mm -hmm. and it's still got that, 
that kind of Hawaii vibe to it as well. And it's just, it's, uh, it's gorgeous. It's a gorgeous area. So, um, so let's, you know, so you got into the condo the first time and now you're kind of looking more into, you know, large multifamily now at this Mm -hmm. point. Um, you know, it's, it's a lot easier to look at market reports and kind of see um, the growth and potential of properties in large multifamily back in the States. Cause it's obviously, uh, it's obviously a lot more reporting and people involved with that. How are you, you know, kind of going about looking at the multifamily market in, in Guam specifically? And, you know, mm-hmm. what are you kind of finding so far? Mm-hmm. Okay. So, you know, like we are, we're not looking, we're doing. We're doing, okay, <laughs> but, fair enough. Right. Yes. So again, like, just like I said earlier, we're in touch with like a lot of the banks in Guam. Um, and we've just been talking to so many people. And Anthony, you're absolutely right. Guam, they don't have that much data. They don't have that many, you know, like um, projects and actually like the few like very like bigger projects are bought by, by foreigners. There are a lot of like people in Philippines go and Taiwan go over there to invest and we cannot find access to their, you know, finance. Um, however, like I know it is a newer territory and a lot of people are intimidated by it. But when a lot of people see risk, we see opportunity. Like, so glass em- half empty versus glass half full. So when a lot, like I say more like, you know, like old school real estate investors, they see Guam and they're like, oh, like I've never heard of this place before. Like it's so far away. It's like a new territory. I don't have any network. I don't have any connection there. I'll never invest in a place like that. But I think a more open-minded, right? As a new generation of investors, we are going to see so much opportunities. We're going to see so much opportunities there because it is not that developed. So there's so much more space for growth, right? You can invest in California, but like look at California. You can barely find like 3% return now. Like all the California investors are going out of state. So like, you know, like Guam is definitely a place that can grow a lot in the next few, few years where a developed market cannot afford, right? Like, so it's just kind of like higher risk, high reward, or do you want to play it safe? And if you want to play it super, super safe, you might as well put all your money in, you know, in government bonds. Right. Yeah, good Mm -hmm. points. Good points. Awesome. I think we could probably talk the whole rest of the hour on this topic, but I really want to get into the snapshot round because I think you'd have some interesting answers. You ready for Mm -hmm. it? Yes, I am. All right. Julia, first question for you. What is your number one failure in real estate? I don't think I've done enough real estate to have a failure yet. Fair enough. Okay. All right. I like that answer. Cool. All right. As an active duty investor, what advice do you have for other military investors to be successful? Have a partner. Like I have multiple people who started around the same time as me, but because they didn't have the kind of partnership Philip and I do, will keep each other accountable 24 seven, allows them just get like, not like, um, like demotivated and they cannot stop halfway because it is very difficult to get started. Mm -hmm. Um, So find a partner, have like a group of people with you. Love it. All right, cool. What inspired you to serve your country? Um, Again, I'm a first generation Chinese American immigrant. Just the fact that I will be competing or like working with like other Americans who are the sons and daughters of very well-established Americans just make me so motivated. And I'm very lucky, but if I'm in a position where I, I can take luck out of the equation, where if you have the ability, you can succeed, mm-hmm. like that would be my goal. I want more people to succeed. If you have the ability, I want everyone to go as far in their life as they can. Love it. All right. And then last question for you, Julie, what is your dream? My dream makes the world a better place. Like, I know that sounds like really big and empty, but I initially joined the military because I wanted to make world peace, given my like Chinese American background. Um, but I realized that's gonna be like, it requires more work than just me trying to make world peace. But I think everyone, we can make the world a better place. Everyone, like we can do our, like take care of the people around us, do the things around us and make the world a better place together. I love it. I love it. Mm -hmm. Julia, I mean, this has been a tremendous interview talking with you about, uh, you know, everything that you've you've managed to accomplish throughout your life, you know, showing up to a brand new country, uh, you know, learning the language and going and excelling through, you know, school and life, getting to the Naval Academy, getting into real estate, you know, just and just kind of crushing it in every aspect of your life. So if 
I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people who are going to want to reach out to you. So if people want to learn more about you, where can they go? Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. I become a lot more active on LinkedIn. If you message me, I'll definitely reply. And again, I can talk. I'm, I'm a talker. So if you want to chat, I'm here to chat. If you know anyone who are interested in like a high risk, high reward kind of investment, please reach out. I'm here to talk. And if you have any connections in Guam that you want to potentially be part of the team, we are very open-minded to the idea as well. Absolutely. I love it. Perfect. All right. And please, if you're interested at all in her story, please reach out to her because I think she's, I mean, I, I've seen her popping up all over the place on LinkedIn. And, you know, this is definitely like like the fifth or sixth time we probably, you know, chatted with each other about about different aspects. And I mean, you know, barely a year out from from graduation and you're you're crushing it. So uh, continue to uh, to be awesome. I hope you stay safe back in the States. And uh, yeah, we'll see you soon here in Japan. Absolutely. You know, when I go to Japan, I definitely want to go and get some sushi with you. Oh, for sure. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll go exploring. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you very much, Anthony, for having me. Absolutely. Thanks for listening. If you are a military investor and found this episode of the Lessons in Real Estate show packed with great information, tell your friends and leave a five-star rating on your listening platform. Every comment is read and appreciated. Don't forget to check out our weekly episodes of PCI Teaches, brought to you by Pinto Capital Investments. Learn about basic and advanced topics in real estate investing. Catch updates on Anthony's journey through learn and teach segments. And listen to the tales of other military investors and real estate professionals every week. We'll catch you next time on the Lessons in Real Estate show.